This audiobook of the original America Burning was produced by the Firefighter Podcast Combustible. More details on this project can be found online at www.combustiblethepodcast.com. The audio for this recording is consistent with all copyright rights and permissions associated with America Burning and is not affiliated with or endorsed in any way by the federal government or the U.S. Fire Administration. Chapter 9. The Hazards Created Through Materials The dazzling terminal buildings at New York's John F. Kennedy Airport are virtually a museum of contemporary architecture. But one of those buildings has demonstrated that man's monuments to his technological genius can turn on him with a vengeance at the mere touch of a flame. The new west wing of the British Overseas Airways Corporation building at Kennedy International had not yet been opened to the public when, on August 26, 1970, it caught fire, probably at the hands of an arsonist. Swiftly, Flames moved from one seat to the next along the 330-foot length of the wing. Gases from the incomplete combustion of the seats gathered in clouds along the ceiling. When flames approached the clouds, the gases ignited explosively, spreading the fire and igniting other groups of seats. The explosions knocked out the terminal's huge glass windows. As the ceiling melted, combustible liquid dripped to the floor, further spreading the fire. In the end, all 600 seats in the wing were consumed, Damages totaled $2 million. The seats, which played the predominant role in spreading the fire, were like those in many airline terminals, layers of plastic and rubber foam covered by plastic upholstery material. No lives were lost in the BOAC terminal fire, but three months later, a synthetic material was implicated in a fire that killed 145 teenagers. It happened in a door-locked dance hall in saint laurent du pont France, that had been lavishly sprayed with a plastic foam to give the appearance of a cave. The fire raged furiously within seconds after it began, leaping like a red panther in a small cage, in the words of one survivor. By no means do synthetics stand alone as hazardous materials. A frame house can be a tinderbox. Restaurants decorated with natural materials, basements full of old newspapers, and warehouses storing lumber or paper products provide the fuel for major fires. Inadequately protected structural elements of steel or concrete still collapse if a fire is intense enough. Burning silk and wool release deadly quantities of carbon monoxide and cyanide gas, and these and many other natural materials ignite at lower temperatures than many synthetics do. Plastic manufacturers contend that synthetics based on carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen exclusively are generally no more toxic when burned than natural materials. On the other hand, other synthetics containing sulfur and the halogens are not so innocuous. Although plastics production has doubled in the past seven years, it is only about one-tenth that of wood, paper, and associated products. The contribution of plastics to the fuel load in buildings, especially older buildings where fires occur more frequently, is therefore certainly well under 10%. But their use is increasing. Wool rugs are giving way to synthetic fibers, wooden desktops to plastics made to look like wood, glass lighting diffusers to clear plastic panels. There is hardly a use to which classical materials have been put that has not been challenged by synthetics. Clearly, the advantages which plastics offer to consumers and manufacturers are many, and plastics will fill an increasingly large proportion of the built environment. What makes plastics relevant to our discussion of materials is not only that many of them have introduced hazards previously uncommon, but that they are sold and used without adequate attention to the special fire hazards they present. The major investigation of the fire problem of some plastics by the Federal Trade Commission has highlighted a form of misleading representation of the combustion behavior of certain plastics. How to Die in a Fire Most people, when they think of fire as a killer, think of flames. Those who have set fire safety standards for materials have emphasized flame resistance. Yet, in a list of the five ways in which fire can kill, when arranged in declining importance, flames rank last. Asphyxiation Fire consumes oxygen from the surrounding atmosphere, thus reducing its concentration. If the oxygen concentration falls below 17%, thinking may be an effort and coordination difficult. Below 16%, attempts to escape the fire may be ineffective or irrational, wasting vital seconds. With further drops, a person loses his muscular coordination for skilled movements, and muscular effort leads rapidly to fatigue. His breathing ceases when the oxygen content falls below 6%. At normal temperatures, 
he would be dead in six to eight minutes. Attack by superheated air or gases. With temperatures above 300 degrees Fahrenheit, loss of consciousness or death can occur within several minutes. In addition, hot smoke with a high moisture content is a special danger since it destroys tissues deep in the lungs by burning. Smoke. Inhalation of smoke, or more correctly, of the products of incomplete combustion, kills people who suffer no skin burns at all. In addition to carrying toxic products, such as carbon monoxide and hydrogen cyanide, thick smoke may be laden with organic irritants, such as acetate acid and formaldehyde. In the early stages of a fire, the irritants, which attack the mucous membranes of the respiratory tract, are often the more important danger. Smoke often blocks the visibility of exits. Toxic Products Many toxic components of smoke are responsible for the damage done, including oxides of nitrogen, aldehydes, hydrogen cyanide, sulfur dioxide, and ammonia, to name only a few. There is ample evidence that the hazard of two or more toxic gases is greater than the sum of the hazards of each. Moreover, low oxygen and high temperatures increase the toxic effects. In addition to toxic gases that attack the lungs, there are irritants that attack the eyes with blinding effect, preventing escape. Some fire gases dull the senses of the victim or his awareness of injury. Flames. Since the aforementioned factors can debilitate, confuse, blind, or kill without warning, the person who goes to sleep confident that advancing flames will provide sufficient warning for escape may be taking a fatal gamble. Until such time as all five of these hazards have been well studied and controlled by material standards, too little will have been done to control the built environment and thus reduce the gamble Americans take in their daily lives. Ironically, efforts to make materials fire retardant, that is, with less tendency to ignite or spread flames, may have increased the life hazard, since the incomplete combustion of many materials treated to increase fire retardancy results in heavy smoke and toxic gases. The technology of fire retardants is often unsatisfactory in other respects. The additives are generally costly, can reduce the strength and weather resistance of the material to which they are applied, and often lose their effectiveness through washing or prolonged exposure to the elements. Where there's smoke, there's damage. That concern about flames alone is insufficient is pointed up by the ample evidence that smoke and toxic gases are powerful forces of destruction. Smoke from restaurant fires renders uncontainered food unusable. Fabrics permeated by smoke can be altered beyond use even after cleaning. And a little smoke can go a long way. A department store recently lost $100,000 of its merchandise and three days business for cleanup, all because of smoke that seeped through walls from an adjoining building on fire. Again, efforts to make materials flame-resistant have not always been beneficial. The sooty smoke given off by many of these materials leaves a thick black coating on whatever it touches. Moreover, the chemical compounds added to reduce combustibility often contain halogens, bromine, chlorine, and fluorine, which are corrosive and toxic. Why be half safe? According to the Society of Plastics Industry Incorporated, manufacturers of plastics spend $40 million annually on research to improve the fire safety of their products. That organization issued to manufacturers in 1964 a fire safety bulletin setting flammability standards for cellular plastics. Fire resistance or fire classification standards for all sorts of construction materials are set by such organizations as the American Society for Testing and Materials and the National Fire Protection Association. Building codes incorporate many of these standards. Underwriters Laboratories, Factory Mutual Research Corporation, and other organizations test materials to see that they comply with such standards. Yet, for all these efforts, the American public remains inadequately protected from combustion hazards in their midst. Smoke and toxic gases have been underrated hazards. Recognition of these hazards has come belatedly, with the result that there is still little understanding, and hence little quantifiable knowledge, of the destructive effects of smoke and toxic gases. As a result, there are no nationally recognized test methods for measuring smoke production, both rate and amount. The American Society for Testing and Materials does have a tunnel test which measures the density of smoke produced. Development of more sophisticated tests, for example ones which would measure toxic and corrosive products of combustion, is hampered by the complexity of the smoke problem. 
A single material can give off many different products of combustion under varying conditions of temperature, humidity, pressure, and other factors. Burning cellulose, for example, can produce 96 different compounds. Most tests do not simulate complexities of real fires. Nationally recognized test methods for evaluating the ignition and flame spread hazards of conventional materials in conventional applications may not be appropriate for evaluating these materials when used in new ways or for evaluating new materials. For example, the ASTM's tunnel test for building materials, devised long before the advent of plastics, would register a low rate of flame spread for a particular plastic, whereas in a real fire environment, that same material will burn with an explosive intensity. As a result, architects, design engineers, building contractors, and ultimately the consuming public may grossly misinterpret or inappropriately extrapolate those test results as indicative of fire safety. Existing large and small scale tests suffer from an inability to predict exact consequences of a real fire, particularly those involving foamed plastics. Improvement of test methods is dependent to a large degree on a better understanding of the basic processes of ignition and combustion and the mechanisms of fire retardancy and smoke generation, and correlating these with actual fire experiences. The Commission recommends that research in the basic processes of ignition and combustion be strongly increased to provide a foundation for developing improved test methods. The economic interests of manufacturers, installers, vendors, and others often run counter to stringent fire safety requirements. For example, in many West Coast communities, because of industry pressures and public preferences, building codes do not outlaw untreated wood shingle roofs, despite their potential for spreading fire. Some important hazards are not covered by building codes. The fire safety requirements of building codes apply mostly to construction materials and interior materials used on walls and ceilings. Comparatively, little attention has been paid to floors and floor coverings, since in the past the contribution to fire spread was minimal. The advent of synthetic rugs and tiles has made greater attention to floors imperative. Building codes do not cover interior furnishings. While most political jurisdictions that have building codes also have fire prevention codes designed to ensure fire safety after a building is constructed and occupied, the fire prevention codes too have little to say about interior furnishings. Moreover, seldom do fire prevention codes apply to private dwellings. Interior furnishings are not regulated partly because they are felt to be the province of the owner or tenant, and partly because until recently there was no motivation to develop tests on which to base code provisions. They would indeed be difficult to regulate, since they are subject to continuing change. While furnishings are likely to remain outside of code provisions, the fact that they contribute significantly to combustion hazards means that building codes only partly satisfy the demands of fire safety. The present practice can be compared to installing a burglar alarm at the front door and leaving the back door wide open. Only to a limited extent is this mitigated by federal flammability standards for fabrics. Consumers use materials with inadequate knowledge of their combustion hazards. Except for flammable liquids and the materials that are used in appliances and wiring, few of the materials that go into the home carry labels vouchsafing their fire resistance or warning of their hazards. The unlabeled hazards are found in draperies, rugs, storage cabinets, upholstered chairs, and other furniture. At present, the housewife working at the kitchen range has no way of knowing that her shiny new kitchen cabinets overhead are an invitation to a disastrous fire if their surface is a hot dip polystyrene coating. A sudden flare-up from burning grease in a skillet might readily ignite the finish on the cabinets, and in no time at all, fire could spread explosively throughout the kitchen. Clearly, homeowners and building tenants need to know the relative hazards of furnishings as well as other materials so that they can minimize the risks. Fire inspectors, whether enforcing a fire prevention code or educating homeowners and tenants, need to know the hazards to carry out their tasks effectively. New Efforts by Government and Industry Federal initiative is needed to help close the gaps left by the voluntary action of industry and the loopholes in material standards and building codes. In 1972, Congress created the Consumer Product Safety Commission, authorizing it to conduct research, studies, and investigations on the safety of consumer products and on improving the safety of such products. The Commission can set standards of composition and design which consumer products must meet. It can require labeling of hazards or instructions for safe use. It can ban products that present an unreasonable risk of injury. 
The materials that go into the built environment come under the purview of the Consumer Product Safety Commission. This commission recommends that the new Consumer Product Safety Commission give a high priority to the combustion hazards of materials in their end use. Specific needs are refined understanding of the destructive effects of smoke and toxic gases, development of standards to minimize those effects, development of labeling requirements for materials, and outright ban of materials in uses that present unreasonable risks. The development of a labeling system identifying combustion hazards is especially important. The purpose of such a system is not to regulate the lives of Americans as an overly rigorous set of standards would do, but to enable consumers to evaluate the combustion hazards of the materials and products they bring into their homes. Further, in public buildings, nursing homes, and other occupancies subject to regulation, the labeling system would enable inspectors to verify adherence to fire load requirements. Though considerable research and testing would be needed, the eventual goal of the labeling program should be to identify fuel contribution, smoke production, and the production of toxic and corrosive gases, as well as such characteristics as ignition temperature and flame spread. We feel we should be candid in expressing our concern that, because the Consumer Product Safety Commission is still in its formative stages, and because other hazards, many of them better publicized than combustion hazards, will be competing for attention, the problem of fire safety may become a delayed priority. The Consumer Product Safety Commission could, on the other hand, give early and deserved attention to the problem of fire safety by tapping the research capabilities of the National Bureau of Standards, universities, the National Standards and Testing Organizations, and private industry through contracts and cooperative arrangements. Indeed, we do not see the Consumer Product Safety Commission supplanting the efforts in the private sector, but complementing them. For one thing, the program we have recommended is extensive and long-range. Protection of the public cannot await completion of such a program. Other steps must be taken. Material producers owe to various publics, building designers, code officials, fire service personnel, and consumers, an expanded and more candid effort to explain the fire characteristics of the materials they sell. Further, the emergence of labeling requirements for materials will not eliminate the need for technical reports, that is, papers describing test data in detail. There will continue to be a body of technically oriented users who need detailed analyses. Technically oriented users will, for example, have to have knowledge of fuel loads beyond that provided by the labeling system. In this connection, the Commission recommends that the present fuel load study sponsored by the General Services Administration and conducted by the National Bureau of Standards be expanded to update the technical study of occupancy fire loads. The information in the National Bureau of Standards, Building Materials and Structures No. 149, a report on various fire loads found in different occupancies published in 1957, is now largely out of date. Flammable Fabrics in 1971, the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare reported that in recent years, more than 3,000 Americans die annually after their clothing catches on fire, and more than 150,000 are injured from this cause. One out of four whose clothing catches fire is a child under 10. Those 65 and over account for 15% of the clothing fires, even though they are less than 10% of the nation's population. The very young and the old are also the persons least able to tolerate burns. When clothing catches fire, the extent and depth of burns are more severe than skin burns on uncovered areas. From the standpoint of fire safety, the human species would be better off naked. A recent study by the National Burn Information Exchange showed that clothing burn victims were four times more likely to die than burn victims spared clothing fire. Their burns covered nearly twice as much body surface. The power to set flammability standards for fabrics now resides with the Consumer Product Safety Commission. During the five years that the Flammable Fabrics program was shared by the Department of Commerce, the Federal Trade Commission, and the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare, only a few standards were promulgated. Those for young children's sleepwear up to size 6X, rugs, small carpets, and mattresses. These standards do nothing to protect the elderly smoker, the housewife whose sleeve passes over the kitchen burner, or the group of eight-year-olds playing with fire in a vacant lot. Notably, they bypass most children between the ages of five and nine, who account for 13% of clothing fire accidents. The Commission recommends that flammability standards for fabrics be given high priority by the Consumer Product Safety Commission. 
Specific needs are research to improve fire retardant processes, extension of flammability standards to further categories of fabric use, development of labeling requirements for other categories, and educational efforts to make consumers aware of fire hazards from clothing and other fabrics. The Commission does not favor unbridled extension of flammability standards to all categories of fabrics. Only grossly hazardous fabrics and fabrics implicated in a very large number of fire accidents should be banned from the marketplace. A preferable direction of emphasis is toward labeling requirements as to combustion hazards. This would honor the cherished principle of free choice while at the same time informing consumers of potential risks and reminding them of the importance of fire. If reinforced by consumer education on fire safety, labeling requirements would have the effect of spurring manufacturers to improve the flame resistance of fabrics. Fireworks One material hazard that has declined over the years, but not to the point of negligible concern, is fireworks. In recent years, fireworks have claimed an average of about 600 reported injuries and 10 deaths annually. Sixty years ago, the annual toll from fireworks was more than 5,000 injuries and 200 deaths. In 1938, the National Fire Protection Association published its Model State Fireworks Law, NFPA 494L, which, where enacted, prohibits the use of all fireworks except those in supervised public displays. Today, a majority of Americans remain insufficiently protected from fireworks accidents, since only 18 states have laws as stringent as the NFPA's model, and an additional eight have laws similar to the model, but with exceptions. The Commission recommends that all states adopt the Model State Fireworks Law of the National Fire Protection Association, thus prohibiting all fireworks except those for public displays. The Importance of Research Adequate regulation of materials in the built environment depends upon adequate testing, and adequate testing, in turn, depends on adequate understanding of combustion and its hazards. That is not to say, however, that progress cannot be made at all three levels simultaneously. Improved testing methods are being pursued. Scientists and engineers at the National Bureau of Standards, for example, are utilizing a smoke chamber which measures, in addition to the density and rate of smoke produced by a sample, the concentration of specific gases emitted. Experts there and elsewhere are improving devices for measuring heat release, ignitability, flame spread, and fire endurance. Other scientists are working on model testing techniques to simulate the conditions of full-scale fires. The technology for more sophisticated testing and the technology for basic research on fire overlap, and the two activities go hand in hand. It is appropriate that the National Bureau of Standards continue to provide leadership in both these areas, the Consumer Product Safety Commission should champion the strengthening of NBS efforts in these areas. At the same time, ongoing efforts of university scientists, manufacturers, and industrial testing laboratories should be encouraged and expanded. One basic goal of research should be to improve understanding of the dynamics of fire, not of flames alone, but of smoke, heat, toxic gases, and oxygen depletion, which together cause more deaths than flames do. The Commission recommends that the Department of Commerce be funded to provide grants for studies of combustion dynamics and the means of its control. Medical research is also pertinent. In Chapter 2, we recommended that the National Institutes of Health undertake a major program of research concerning smoke inhalation injuries. One outgrowth of that research should be new knowledge concerning human tolerances of various products of combustion. From this knowledge, Standards can be derived setting maximum allowable outputs of various products of combustion for materials. The Commission recommends that the National Bureau of Standards and the National Institutes of Health cooperatively devise and implement a set of research objectives designed to provide combustion standards for materials to protect human life. It would be appropriate for NIH to bring these objectives to the attention of the community of medical scientists, to incorporate appropriate objectives in its own research programs, and to transmit to the Consumer Product Safety Commission pertinent research results. A question of priorities. The hazards of materials in the built environment will never be eliminated completely, and they cannot be significantly reduced overnight. Tinderbox houses will remain in the environment until economic circumstances favor their replacement, or until wear and tear dictate their removal. In settings where we are forced to live with hazardous materials, we must turn to engineering means. 
automatic sprinklers, for example, or early warning detection and alarm systems to compensate for the dangers. But for the future, we as a nation cannot rely on these systems alone to protect us. The materials themselves must be improved for fire safety. True, a building constructed of fire-safe materials and having an automatic extinguishing system as well offers a certain redundancy of protection. But one without the other leaves open possibilities of disaster.